Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Dominic Wombacher. I'm Senior Partner Solutions Architect um, for SUSE at AWS. My job is um, to help SUSE to bring their products um, to AWS, but also to support partners and customers um, to optimize existing workloads and migrate new workloads. Today, I talk about Rancher on AWS and the integration with other AWS services. Um, later in that session, I will share um, two links with you. So keep your smartphones ready to scan the QR code or to make a picture. Our agenda for today's session, um, we go from Amazon region design, then to Rancher on, on Amazon EKS. We dive into um, integration with AWS services, and then we take a look into the future. I want to briefly talk about the Amazon region design, mainly how Amazon defines regions and availability zones. AWS has 31 regions and 99 availability zones around the globe. Um, five new regions are coming soon. These are the red ones. Um, and these are Canada West, Israel, Thailand, Malaysia, and New Zealand. The um, region design. A region is a geographical location with multiple availability zones. So the um, orange thing in the middle, that's actually our region. Um, networking between availability zones and the transit, that's all redundant. Every availability zone consists of one or more data centers. These data centers are also with redundant power, networking, and connectivity. <coughs> and all these availability zones inside a region are many kilometers apart from each other, so, but they are all within a range of roughly 100 kilometers. This provides high resiliency and low latency. If there's an issue with one availability zone, it's very unlikely that it will affect another availability zone. Rancher on EKS. Um, that's actually the, let's say, most popular and most powerful integration with AWS. We have Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service, EKS. That's our managed Kubernetes offering. Um, Amazon takes care about high availability, patching, scaling for you. Then we also have um, EKS Anywhere. It's based on EKS Distro, which also powers our EKS offering in the cloud, but you can install it on-prem. And then as for component, we have Rancher um, to actually provide the centralized management of all these Kubernetes components. Let me walk you through the architecture. Um, on the left side hand, we have um, an Amazon managed VPC. And in this managed VPC, we have for each EKS cluster a dedicated control plane. This control plane is spread across diff uh, multiple availability zones for high availability. The middle section is the customer in a customer managed uh, VPC. This is where the actual worker nodes are located. High availability is achieved by, for example, auto-scaling, and also that nodes are spread across multiple availability zones. And on the top layer, we have a dedicated EKS cluster for the management plane for Rancher. So Rancher runs on EKS. EKS manages the whole cluster. And then in the middle, we have another EKS cluster. But this time, this cluster is deployed and managed directly by Rancher. So that, that's one of the integrations. Rancher is actually capable to deploy resources like EKS and manage them. At the bottom, there's another cluster. It's another option with Rancher that Rancher deploys EC2 instances. And on top, an RKE cluster, for example. In that case, the control plane is also located um, on this cluster, so there's no separate control plane somewhere else. And then on the right-hand side, we have on-premises. 
um, for example, connected through VPN, AWS Direct Connect. And let's assume you have an K3S cluster there or an EKS Anywhere cluster. Um, but they can also be managed from Rancher, which is running on AWS. So you have the same tool, um, the same way. There is no need to run a separate solution for that. Now that we talked about all these designs and these involved parts, um, now remember the upper thing where you have EKS cluster, you have VPCs, you have subnets, you have a load balancer. Um, what do you think? How many steps are required and how long does it take to, to set that up? Any guesses? Yeah, five. Five steps? Anyone else? One? Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Um, cheater. Um, it's indeed. It's five steps. <laughs> Woohoo! And it uh, took 20 minutes to do that. Um, but yeah, let's take a look how, how that's actually possible. Um, these are the five steps. So the step one is to create an IAM role. Second step is to create a Route 53 zone or use an existing one. The first step is to deploy the Rancher setup from the AWS Marketplace listing as EC2 instance. Step four is to assign the IAM role that we created in the first step to this new EC2 instance. And then step five is to actually run the setup. Um, when I take a look on that, I guess I missed something because there is a sixth step. Um, that, that's your coffee break, by the way. So you just wait and, and your cluster is ready. Um, if you want to go ahead and try that by yourself, my entry setup is available on Marketplace. It's a free listing, so you only pay for the resources that you leverage from AWS. Um, that being said, if you need um, professional support from SUSE, you can always add that at a later point as add-on to your cluster. So, now that we have Ranch running on AWS, um, how can we actually integrate it with other services than EKS? Those are the different types of integrations I want to talk about today. Um, we have a focus on logging, backup, monitoring, and authentication. But first, a quick refresh about some important terminology. Um, if you know that already, that's, that's your chance for a three-minute power nap. Um, otherwise, well, just go ahead. First thing is um, AWS IAM role. Um, such a role is used to um, yeah, define which user or service is allowed to access resources on AWS. Um, you have a permission policy which is attached to such a role. And this defines actually what I can do and with, with which service. Yeah, for example, I'm allowed to read from an S3 bucket. My trust relationship at the bottom defines who can assume this role to actually perform actions based on the defined permissions. Another important thing to understand is um, EC2 instance roles. So I have an EC2 instance, and I can attach an IAM service role to that. And this um, grants access for every application which is running on this EC2 instance to an AWS service. Um, that, that's fine when you just have one application running on that system, right? Because well, then you want that. Um, in scenarios where you have multiple applications running, um, maybe even multi-tenancy where you have containers, where Kubernetes comes into the picture, that's actually a problem because then you would grant these kind of permissions to every container. Let's make an example. Um, let's say we have Rancher and we want to back up something to an S3 bucket. We would create a profile and say, hey, you have write permissions to this bucket. Um, the problem is that if we use an EC2 instance profile, then not just Rancher has these permissions, but also other containers on the same system. That's a problem because that could lead to, I don't know, data leak, data manipulation, things like that. And then on the other side, um, we have 
classic AWS access keys. Um, these are long-term credentials. Normally, they have no expiry date. They are linked to an IAM account. Um, the credentials could be leaked, accounts shared, to broad permissions assigned whatsoever. So I think there are a lot of scenarios. As always, um, there might be cases where it's OK to use these approaches. It really depends on my use case. But when it comes to containers, um, I highly suggest that, that these both methods are avoided whenever possible. So if I say we avoid that, how do we actually grant permissions? Um, that problem can be solved when we use IAM roles for service accounts, or in short, IRSA. That's a feature where we assign AWS IAM roles to a Kubernetes service account. This feature is out of the box available on EKS, and it helps us to follow security best practices by providing short-term credentials, but also um, following least privileged principles. When I use AWS CLI or SDK to access resources, um, that's supported. So they, they can leverage this, this kind of um, authentication method. How does IRSA work under the hood? Let's walk through, through these different steps. Um, the first step is that we need to establish a reference between our EKS cluster and AWS IAM. That's done via IODC. Um, that's something that you do once for a cluster by using the EKS CTL tool. The second thing is our reference between a Kubernetes service account and an AWS IAM role. That's also done via EKS CDL. That can be done in two ways. So you can either leave it up to EKS to create and manage the service account and link that role. Or if um, you want to use an existing service account, you can only link the role. So both options are possible. The third step is the configuration. So we apply a so-called service annotation to our Kubernetes resource. And in step four, we have this pod identity webhook. Um, as soon a pod starts with this annotation, the service account annotation is um, applied, the webhook will change the configuration of that pod to be um, yeah, to actually leverage and use IRSA. In step five, the pod is now at a point where it actually needs permissions. So it assumes the specified IAM role and connects to the um, AWS security token service. AWS STS verifies if that request is valid. So uh, is the reference there, is a the role assigned, and stuff like that with AWS AM, IAM, IAM service. And then it goes back and assigns temporary credentials. And with these temporary credentials, I can then start using AWS service or interacting with AWS service from inside my pod. The thing is, it's really limited to that pod with that service account and no one else. And I don't need hard-coded credentials or something. It just works. Let me now take a look what that means for Rancher and integrations with Rancher. Let's start with backup. Um, we use Amazon S3 as a target. Rancher provides a backup and restore operator for that. Um, I could use access keys, but we learned for security purposes, IRSA is a better choice. So I can assign this service account annotation already during the installation of my Helm chart. How that looks like? It's these three lines at the bottom. So I need to define a service account, annotation, and I say EKS Amazon AWS.com slash role RN, and then I have this long string. That's the unique ID of my IAM role I want to be assigned, and that's it. The operator creates the service account, 
And from there, this pod identity webhook that we saw earlier takes over and does the rest of the configuration for me. It's quite similar when it comes to logging. Um, we'll use CloudWatch as central log location. Rancher logging Helm chart um, is based on cube logging operator. It used Fluent Bit to actually gather um, the logs and Fluent D to forward the logs. When we enable enhanced cloud provider logging, I also get the EKS logs. So it's not just the node logs, the application logs, I also get the logs from the underlying EKS cluster. And as of today, um, the service account annotation need to be configured after the installation. So I first install the Ranger logging operator, and afterwards I change the config. That looks like this. Um, in this example, where we run Rancher on EKS, with enhanced logging enabled, there are two logging resources that need to be adjusted afterwards. It's Ranger logging root and Ranger logging EKS. And I have to apply these six lines, but it should look familiar. Now, it's a little different syntax, but overall it's the, it's the same thing. We say which service account and which role to use. Then we have the pod, uh, pod identity webhook. There's the configuration for us. Let's now um, take a look on authentication. For smaller and POC environments, I guess it's fine to use the local user management, Ranger. But to centralize it, Ranger comes with various authentication providers, for example, um, LDAP, OAuT, OIDC, and SAML. We have AWS Identity Center. Um, that's actually our SAML identity, identity provider. User can either be managed directly in Identity Center, or I can link it to an AWS managed Microsoft Active Directory. And AWS Identity Center comes with roughly 300 pre-integrated apps, but can also use custom SAML applications like Rancher. AWS managed Microsoft AD, um, Active Directory, as you know it, as you would have it also on-prem, it's um, deployed across two availability zones by default, and you can add additional domain controller if you want to. From a Rancher perspective, AWS Managed Microsoft Active Directory can be used with the Active Directory LDAP authentication provider, which is included in Rancher. For SAML, there is no official AWS authentication provider yet, but my tests with the Keycloak SAML provider were successful, so that could be used um, from you as interim solution when you want SAML authentication with Identity Center, but keep in mind that this would be more community supported and a best effort supported solution. And last but not least, monitoring. Amazon provides managed um, services for Grafana and Prometheus. The approach from Rancher monitoring is to deploy a separate um, Prometheus and Grafana stack per cluster. This is how such a setup looks like. So you have Rancher, you have three downstream clusters, and every cluster has Grafana, every cluster has Prometheus, every cluster collects logs and has a dashboard and so on and so forth. What I personally, personally think what would be a better approach is a more centralized approach um, where metrics from all clusters go to one central place, like manage Prometheus and then manage Grafana. With such an approach, um, we save a lot of resources on the actual downstream clusters. Um, and also, it reduces complexity. And it allows me to have one central place where I can have all my metrics and my overview of all my clusters. To sum up what, what we talked about and the state of the integration, um, you see that I 
marked logging and backup with a yellow arrow. What I mean with that is they are technically fully functional, but to be fair, they could use some improvement when it comes to documentation or to make the setup easier, like you know, with the logging stuff where you should be able to um, define it during the installation of your home chart and not afterwards. Orange on the right side for monitoring authentication. Um, that is functional, but it's not that well integrated. So what I mean is, I think we could do better in that case um, by providing, for example, the authentication area, an official provider for identity center, or to provide a Helm chart to set up this centralized um, monitoring approach. How will the future look like? Seamless integration. That's, that's our mission statement, and that's what we actually want to achieve. I think that um, integrations with other services, they should just work. It's nothing we should be worried about. Um, it should be available out of the box, and it should be really easy to use. So you don't, shouldn't study documentations for hours to just get something running. Some concrete goals, how that could be achieved. Um, AWS reference architectures to help customers to understand what's the best approach to um, set up an environment for a specific use case. Improved Ranger documentation, so that's really something that should be better covered, more streamlined to explain to you exactly what needs to be done. An officially supported authentication provider for, for AWS Identity Center would be beneficial. And when we have IRSA support in all Ranger core components. So we saw that it works for logging and for backup. Um, but what would I like to see is that it also works for deploying EKS clusters, managing EKS clusters, deploying EC2 resources. That would be, in, in my opinion, um, a large step forward because today we need access keys for that. And last but not least, this centralized monitoring stack that I presented earlier. Um, I think that would be very valuable to just really lower the resource usage in the cluster. Again, feedback is very important for us at Amazon. So please take a few seconds to fill out that short survey. And now it's time for your questions. Thank you. I actually had a, uh, a question on the last slide where you talked about IR as a uh, enablement IRS. of Rancher. Could you explain this a bit what this means? I understood that Rancher will then deploy EC2. So we do top-down integrations, but is it so that Rancher will now make calls to the AWS API and deploy new, new EC2 infrastructure? Is that what this means? Uh, okay. There's two different things. So Rancher allows already today, that's the main thing of Rancher, to deploy EC2 instance for you and run clusters on top. This IRSA um, feature that I talked about, that's for authentication purposes so that we go away from um, access keys, from long-term credentials, and to move to something with temporary credentials. So that's... Welcome. Any other questions? Doesn't look like. Cool, perfect. Then thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the OpenSUSE Conference 2023.